I completely, egregiously, horrifically underestimated the pain and difficulty and cost that my family would bear for for what I do. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high-demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you're listening only, head on over to my YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, where you can like, subscribe, hit the bell so you don't miss an episode. Leave your comments. We would like to start featuring comments now, so if you have anything burning that you would like to ask, leave it below. Send her money. Sign up for her Patreon. <laughs> Go to Colts to Consciousness at Patreon.com. What is Patreon it? Patreon.com slash Colts to Consciousness. Yeah, I really mean it when I say you are very talented. And I think, I hope you continue because you're, you're already going gangbusters for only doing <laughs> this four or five months. But I hope you eclipse me. And I think there's a good chance that you will. So I hope you'll keep going. And I'm just so thrilled you're in this space. Wow, John, thank you. I mean, I look up to you so much and what you've been able to build in your channel. And there's been so many times where Jonathan and I are having conversation. I'm like, what does John do? I need to see how he does things. Because you really created something pretty amazing that everyone can attest to the ways that you've helped them out of their faith crisis and into finding who they really are. So the the respect is mutual and i really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me i'm just thrilled and honored that everyone can have this information for themselves today's guest you probably already recognize the studio i am currently sitting in the mormon stories studio the number one voice in the ex-mormon space he has a phd in counseling psychology he has been podcasting since 2005 and he has been featured on many different publications and a whole bunch of other podcasts he is an expert voice in this space i have oh man I just have so many questions that I want to ask John Dillon here go. because, you know, I've been following your podcast for a while. What are the most shocking things that you've ever heard in your interviews? Mm. Wow. Uh, things that have really stood out to you. Yeah. I mean, we've covered, like, if people are kind of like, John, you're off the chain, like you're, you're overly exuberant, you're angry, you're like way too passionate. What, what, you know, what people need to understand is that my passion comes from spending 20 years, two decades swimming in these waters. Yeah. So I know parents who have lost their children to death by suicide. I have close family and friends who have been suicidal because of their LGBTQ nature. I've seen marriages torn apart and I've seen grandparents estranged from their own grandkids and, you know, uh, I've seen uh, so much horrific stuff. I've seen people, you know, I've seen wives f shame their husbands into sleeping on the sofa or, or kicking them out of the house because they masturbated once every three weeks. And then the kids being estranged from their parents. Like I've seen so much horrific carnage that when I per am perceived to be angry or overly passionate, it's because I have corresponded with tens of thousands of Mormons who have lived this carnage. That's where my passion comes from. So having said that, what are some interesting things uh, on Mormon Stories podcast? One of the most shocking things that I uh, learned on Mormon Stories podcast was about the second anointing. If you, mm, have you I, learned covered it from, that I learned it from you. Oh yeah. Yeah. Have you covered it on your podcast? No, yet? I haven't. Okay. Yeah. So like, it's always crazy when when you've been a Mormon your whole life for decades, going to BYU, going to gazillion hours of church, learning everything you can, and then you learn something completely new that's incredibly shocking and yeah. even revolting yeah. that was kept from you. And the second anointing is just that. So uh, Orthodox Mormons or never Mormons, if you don't know, <laughs> there's a super secret temple ordinance called the second anointing which uh, has been around since the time of Joseph Smith. And it's basically, basically how it happens is you're called, you know, by your stake president, uh, you know, by one of your church leaders. And they say, you and your spouse show up at the temple on a Sunday morning at 8 a.m. And don't tell anyone you're coming. Literally lie to your friends and family if they ask you where you're going. Keep it from them. Show up at the, at the Mormon temple and something very special is going to happen. So you show up and you're there with like five or six other couples and 
a Mormon apostle shows up. Now in Mormonism, a Mormon apostle is viewed as a special witness of Christ. And Mormons are taught culturally to believe that, that the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, the 15 men that run the Mormon Church, are all special witnesses of Christ, which means they talk to Christ. Right, directly. They, they've met Christ, they've spoken to Christ, and that's what we're all led to believe. So this person who knows Jesus on a personal level, one of the top 15 leaders of the church, is there, meets you at the temple, invites you in, and basically performs this holy ordinance for and with you and your spouse, basically promising you that you are going to become a God someday. You have arrived. You are not only going to make it to heaven, you're making it to the celestial kingdom, and not just the celestial kingdom, which is the third highest tier of heaven, but you're making it to the, the highest level of the celestial kingdom, which is the third tier in the third tier, uh -huh. where you're going to become exalted and be made a God and a goddess to rule over your own Mormon planet or planets someday. Um, and... And so they do what's called the second anointing. And they basically anoint you and your spouse with oil. I, I guess they put oil on your head and they anoint you with hand. I, I'm a Don't little rusty, but, but they also wash your feet. Mm -hmm. the, the apostle, the representative of Jesus washes your feet. Oh, he does and your, it. I, I, I don't, like I'm rusty on the details, but there's <laughs> feet washing involved. And eventually I think the wife and the husband retreat into a room where the wife washes the feet of the husband. Yeah, that, that right? checks out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'm pretty sure the apostle washes the feet of the two of That's the couple. The man. Oh, I wow. think you, you guys can go look it up. Yeah. Tell me I'm wrong. I don't care. Enough of what I've said is right. Yeah. Uh, that that I'll, I'll stand by it. And the point I'm making is, is that, why is this horrific? Well, number one, it's horrific because it's a super sacred ordinance that has been withheld from the general membership for over a century. But number two, it turns out that it's that it's it's this elite privileged ordinance where like once you get the second anointing, then like your leaders ask you, hey, who's it's almost like a multi-level marketing scam. It's like, well, who do you recommend that you think should also be? And it's normally oh wealthy. Gosh wealthy grandparents that have given a crap ton of money to the church and then their children, you know, and, and it's, it's basically like if you have committed enough of your lives, if you're wealthy enough, if you're powerful enough, if we want to make sure you never leave and we want to reward you for all the time and money and reputation that you've given to the church, we're going to give you this super secret elite ordinance and promise you literally, and this is the other shocking part that the only thing you can do to disqualify yourself from exaltation, from becoming a god, is what, Shalise? Is it murder? It's murder. <laughs> I'm surprised it's not sexual sin. <laughs> no. So literally, by by the by the rules of the second anointing, you can be a pedophile or a rapist and still make it to the top. Absolutely. What do you, what do you think it does to the psychology no. of a human to tell them they're basically superiority can, complex can do no wrong as yeah. long as you don't murder, you're good. Like the, the horrible things on this earth. Just think of Chad Debo and Lori Vallow. They believed that they, that they were gods. They believed that they were invincible. So they kill their spouses and children thinking there's going to be no consequence because they've got God's power on their side. Like, trust me, I have a psychology background. Once you start telling humans they're invincible, horrible, horrific things happen. And so, yeah, promising these wealthy elite Mormons that because they've got the right you know, parents or grandparents, because they know the right people, because they gave enough money that they're going to be God someday. And there's nothing they could do in the remaining years of their life to, uh, to disqualify themselves. It's just horrific on, on 15 different levels. And then that it's, it's withheld a school teacher who's just a humble school teacher that never is wealthy, that isn't connected to some apostle School teachers and, and traditional housewives or or husbands or whatever, they're never going to get access to this ordinance. It's only if like your grandparents are apostles or your parents are super wealthy. Only the elite are gonna are gonna even get access to this ordinance. 
So I don't know. Is, is that horrific? Like for some people, I think people, that's, that's definitely shocking. When yeah. I first heard it on your channel, I was yeah. like, "Wait, what? There's yeah. like a super secret club in Mormonism? I thought Mormonism's already a super secret club." And yeah. I got like all this. Well, that's one of the definitions of a. It's one of the criteria of a cult. Yeah, is when there's secret levels where the more you advance within the high demand religion or cult, the more you learn. Right. But that super secret troubling stuff. Like the branding of Sarah Edmondson right. within Nexium, right? Like uh, all that super secret stuff that's most shocking and troubling is withheld Until you from get to the, the low top. rank from the low rank members. Yeah, that's like you know, other than like getting your own name. Like there are a few things where if it's happening to you, you're freaking in a cult. One is if you're you're being given a new name by your organization, and another is if there's super secret rituals where well, you're not told about them at the beginning, but you're told about them as you advance in yep. money and power. Like they, those are two sure signs of a cult. Yeah. They, they take away your identity, yeah. give you a new identity yep. and then tell you not to tell anyone. Yep. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. So that's one. Yeah. Second anointing. That's a good one. Is, is that's that right? a good one. Is that good? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it was, it was shocking to learn that the Mormon church, uh, participated in electroshock therapy of LGBT right. students at BYU where basically they were, you know, shown erotic gay porn as BYU students and then were, were shocked. Some say shocked on their genitals. Yeah. Whenever they got aroused. Right. And it was a form of, of aversion therapy, which is different than conversion therapy. Oh. It was a form of aversion therapy, thinking that like rats – if you administered the right operant conditioning, you could degayify somebody through aversive stimuli. And basically it just drove these young gay BYU students mad and made many of them want to kill themselves. And yeah. the Mormon church, not only did the Mormon church um, participate in that at BYU in the seventies, but the current number two leader in the Mormon church, Dallin H. Oaks, who is next in line to be the prophet, he was the president of BYU who approved those experiments. Mm -hmm. It's a little shocking. Literally shocking. <laughs> no. And um, yeah, I, I heard about that too. I think they actually released a documentary of some of these men who had to go through this. And I haven't watched it myself yet. They covered it on Not Somali Mormon podcast. And they even mentioned one where they inject something into their veins that makes them nauseous and throw up. And then make yeah. them watch porn. So, oh, it's so frustrating and yeah. and sad that people had to go through this. Yeah, and and one of the reasons I'm harder on the Mormon Church than maybe other organizations is because it's one thing to do harm. Like, you know, if you just look at the general medical industry or even the the field of psychiatry, you go back into the 40s and 50s they were like performing lobotomies on people indiscriminately. And this isn't Mormonism. This is just like, oh, we think lobotomies will help cure, you know, bipolar. Yeah. And so they're like literally like separating the corpus callosum with a knife and and scrambling parts of people's brains. With an ice just pick. Just like, yeah, with the, exactly through the nose or the Ugh. eye socket with the ice pick. Like horrific stuff, just kind of like trying shit out to help people who are like not doing so well. Like... So like the, you know, modern medicine or mo modern psychiatry has a really horrific track record and a good track record of like doing experiments to try and figure things out. Like, okay, we're going to cut humanity some slack for, for making some errors along the way. I can do that. I can hold a space of empathy and understanding for the fact that, you know, 200 years ago, we thought spirits were what, like, Evil spirits were what caused depression. Like we didn't know, we're making stuff up. So, yeah. so like I, I can have a place in my heart of empathy for, for social science or science gone wrong. Mm -hmm. What's different about Mormonism is the Mormon church gains its power by telling people it's led by God and Jesus. Mm -hmm. So it's one thing to say, I'm a medical doctor doing my best to like help people. So I'm gonna perform some experiments to see if this helps. Like, yeah, there are unethical and ethical ways to do that, but you're going to cut those people slack. When you're performing electroshock therapy on gay Mormon men on their genitals, 
saying that you represent Jesus and God, yeah. and that this that God and Jesus, in effect, approve of this experiment, or even in a less benign way, God and Jesus told me, the Mormon prophet, that your gay lifestyle is next to bestiality and 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 uh, pedophilia in terms of evil. Yeah. And, and you're telling them that it's God and Jesus who believe that? That's a whole order of magnitude level more severe, more abusive, and uh, and more damaging. So yeah, I, I expect more of the Mormon church because their power and their wealth is tied to convincing people that they're, everything they do is, is from the lips of God and Jesus. And mm -hmm. I'm not exaggerating. Yeah. You have spiritual abuse, emotional abuse, mental abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, sexual abuse, all under the guise of this is what God wants for you. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's the second shocking thing. Wow. Should we, I go, mean, should we keep going? Do you have another one? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> Lay them on me, John. <laughs> so I did this whole series called losing the Lamanites. Okay. Which was, which was, um, so, so obviously we've already talked about one of the most horrific doctrines of Mormonism, which is that Native Americans, I mean, this is shocking, but this isn't the shocking thing. Yeah. This is the foundation of the shocking thing. So there's this thing called the mound builder myth, which was this belief in the 1700s in America that like, whoa, we're finding all these really cool civilizations, re you know, remnants of really sophisticated civilizations. But, and I'm using, I'm using the language of white words. 19th yeah. century America. But clearly these savages, these dark, you know, uh, savages couldn't have, they're not intelligent enough. They're not sophisticated enough to have been able to develop this agriculture and art in these major civilizations. There must have been a white race that lived here in America that built all these amazing techniques and civilizations that were then killed off. I mean, obviously dark civilizations couldn't, couldn't have done this amazing stuff. So, so clearly these dark Native Americans that are all around us who we're displacing and committing genocide towards, right? Clearly they couldn't have done it. So they must have killed off this white race of people. So that was a thing. Like Thomas Jefferson, like Benjamin Franklin, if you go back to the 1700s in America, that was kind of a general understanding that somehow like the, the, 12 tribes of Israel, some of the remnants, the Jews of the 12 tribes of Israel somehow made their way over to America as white settlers developed all these amazing civilizations. And somehow these dark civilizations killed off all the white people. And that's who, who, you know, the, the Puritans and the pilgrims found when they came over and the conquistadors when they came over and settled North America and mm -hmm. central and South America. So that's the mound builder myth, right? Mm -hmm. So, so clearly when Joseph Smith created the Book of Mormon, uh, he, he needed a framework to tell the story of the Book of Mormon. So he literally like copies and pastes the Mount Builder myth into the Book of Mormon. So that, that's the, what I just told you is the central premise of Mormonism's holiest text, mm -hmm. right? The Book of Mormon believes everything I just told you about dark-skinned and light-skinned Native Americans. And the, the dark-skinned, you know, Lamanites killed off the white and delightsome Nephites. And that's actual text, white and delightsome. Absolutely. Yeah. Dark and loathsome Lamanites, white and delightsome Nephites in Mormon scripture today, 2022, has not been removed. So, um, so this is the teaching of the Lamanites. So whenever any any native american or or latino or pacific islander joins the mormon church they're taught that they are the descendants of the lamanites as if it's an honor as if it's some great honor because on the one hand they're told they're the descendants of israel because obviously these native americans were the descendants of the 12 tribes of israel somehow and so they're the pure blood of israel so that's the good news the bad news is your ancestors were made dark and loathsome so that you would be viewed as repulsive by the, by the white Nephites who were killed off by your an, wicked ancestors. So that's the, that's the downside of being a Lamanite, right? So, so this idea of the Lamanite. So if you were 
joined the church or baptized in the church in Latin America or, or the Pacific Islanders, you were told, you're not Apache, you're not Mayan, you're not Incan, you're not Tongan or Maori, you're a Lamanite, right? Yeah. Your, your cultural identity is this Christian fan fiction frontier <laughs> American identity <laughs> that Joseph Smith pulled out of his rear and slapped on the Book of Mormon. That's your actual cultural identity. Why are you laughing? <laughs> because it's ridiculous. It is. A, it's just erasing, it's so offensive. Erasing the indigenous cultures. That, like if you don't cry or scream or shoot someone, you, you laugh. You have to laugh. You have to laugh. Yeah. Because it's so awful. Yeah, it's so awful. So anyway, so like imagine generations of of dark skinned Mormons being taught that they're Lamanites. So you reach twenty the twenty ten twenty teens. I'm doing Mormon stories, and I'm like. Whoa. So like what happens when someone who's been taught their whole life that they're a Lamanite loses their faith in the Mormon church and all of a sudden they're like, whoa, I had this whole identity that I had assumed based on what the church taught me that now I'm realizing I'm actually Incan or Mayan or Maori or Samoan. Mm -hmm. like, what's that like? So I, I, I interviewed a bunch of ex-Mormon Native Americans or ex-Mormon Pacific Islanders about their experience. And and definitely one of the most tragic things I experienced um, on Mormon Stories was hearing these people tell their story because like like Sarah, um, you know, one of the people I interviewed, Sarah, she talked about growing up, she comes uh, from kind of Alaska, uh, Native American tribes kind of in the Pacific Northwest slash Alaska. And um, Sarah talked about how there was this Mormon prophecy that if you were righteous enough, your skin would turn lighter. Yeah. That the more righteous you got, you and your descendants would become lighter skinned. And so she would like, as an adolescent Mormon teen, she would be super righteous, super righteous, and then look at her skin and oh. see that it stayed dark. No. But then what was worse is there'd be like a church activity where they'd go swimming. So she would go out in a bathing suit the sun would tan. hit and she would get even more tan. So oh. she'd become even more dark. And for her, that was a sign that she was becoming less, more wicked instead of more righteous. So she talked about like in the summer, going out to like church activities, wearing long sleeves so that her skin wouldn't, and, and sunscreen and hats. Imagine you're at a lake or at the beach and you're covered up with long sleeve shirts and a hat and sun, sunscreen because you're trying to defy the laws of physics yeah. and prevent your skin from from getting naturally darker. And that was her teenage years trying to fulfill Mormon prophecy of having her skin tone get lighter. There was also another Native American um, that that we interviewed who used to rub lemon on <sighs> on her skin because she believed in some sort of folk wisdom that if you rubbed lemon on your skin, it, it would, would turn, it. it would bleach your skin and make yeah. it lighter. So like that's, that's part of, you know, the many horrific examples of the, the Mormon quote, Lamanite experience. That is heartbreaking. Yeah. That is, what was the end of her story? When did she get out and how is she doing? Oh uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, what episode and we'll link it right here. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, she is one of she is one of my favorite uh, she is one of my favorite Mormon stories interviews of all time. Her name is Sarah Newcomb. Okay. S A R A H Newcomb N E W C O M B. And I've interviewed her a few times, but either Google the Losing the Lamanite series or Sarah Newcomb. Okay. And you'll get uh, some amazing, horrific, and inspiring stories. Yeah. And I, I heard about the, the Native American placement program where they would take children off of these reservations, put them in Mormon homes. And who was it, one of the higher-ups in the church, that literally lined up the kids, took pictures, and was like, see, they're getting wider. Yeah, Spencer Kimball. Kimble. Ugh, friggin' yeah. Kimball. I could do without Kimball. I know, and the miracle of forgiveness comes from him as well. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, the, the Indian placement program, this is what it was called, was basically cultural colonization at its worst. Uh, where, where Mormons, white Mormon families would take, well, Native American, well, Lamanite, Native American Mormon parents would give their kids to white 
Mormon Utah and Idaho families in Arizona to be raised by white parents because they were taught that they had no business raising these kids, that if they were raised in white Mormon homes and and attended, you know, sort of, uh, you know, Indian schools where they could be assimilated properly into white American culture, that eventually they would become righteous and their curses would be reversed. And of course their skin would, would lighten over time. Like I'm literally not making this up. Yeah. Google Indian placement program and the Mormon church and the Mormon prophet, the prophets were behind this program. Yeah. I think that was one of the most shocking things that I heard about the church just a couple years ago where I thought, wait a second, I was supposed to believe that as a Mormon. I had no idea that was even a thing. So even after hearing all of these horrific stories, you've been doing this since 2005, you've interviewed thousands of people. What is it that makes you continue to want to do this work? What inspires you to continue on this path? Oh, you mean we're going to stop with the horrific things? Like I mean, the, do you have no, more? I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Keep going. That I just trick. have to say that was a good segue, Thank and you. I have more, but we'll, <laughs> maybe we'll save it for our, my next interview. With okay, you. part two. <laughs> part two. Yeah. Okay. So why do I do this work? Yeah. Why do I do this? What inspires you to keep going after you yeah. hear all of this, these tragic yeah. stories? Yeah. So I've been doing this work for twenty years. Like it's kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, and you would think I would like I had a hard time staying with one job. Like. Even at Microsoft, I was there seven years. I probably had seven different jobs at Microsoft. Like, I probably could meet criteria for ADHD. And I've been doing this so long, it, it basically makes no sense that I'm still doing it. I think I, and this isn't a flex, it's just a fact. I think I have one of the longest running podcasts in the history of the world. Because you won't find many, if any, podcasters that have been doing it since 2005. Mm -hmm. So why in the heck am I still doing it, right? Yeah. Especially when it's so heavy. Yeah. Right. And then the truth is like, I had the benefit of having careers for the first 15 years of my life that I w wasn't passionate about. I thought about law school, but then I didn't, didn't know many lawyers that loved their jobs. I got into tech, which was fun, but was ultimately in many ways shallow and superficial. And it wasn't until I found Mormon Stories podcast and started uh, learning about the lives of the people that Mormon Stories Podcast influenced that I saw all this horrific carnage that we've been talking about mm -hmm. for this entire episode. And um, as a result, uh, I realized that this was an incredible opportunity to prevent divorce, to keep families from being destroyed, to prevent death by suicide, to improve people's mental health, to improve marriages, to alleviate anxiety and depression, to basically, it was this massive pool of suffering people who also, by the way, were universally deceived into these very damaging ways of life. I could be part of a small part, a decent part of their liberation from undue influence. And uh, I could help prevent or heal the massive carnage that Mormons were experiencing within a Mormon context. So like, I don't think there's any bigger gift in life than to find a purpose or a cause that makes it so every single day, you literally never have to set your alarm clock. I do not set my alarm clock because somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., I wake up and say, I can't wait to get to work today. Like that's literally my life for the past 18 years. I don't have a job. I have a passion, I have a cause mm. that now I happen to get paid for. And so like every day, if you get to wake up and say, I get to prevent a divorce today, I get to prevent a suicide today, I get to heal a family today, I get to alleviate depression and anxiety, I get to do things that would make people wanna stop me on the street and say, hey, thanks for thanks for helping helping me out. That's, that's, that's like the Holy Grail, like King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table sought the Holy Grail I found it. The Holy Grail, little little safety tip, a little secret uh, life tip. The Holy Grail of the human experience is finding a cause where you can alleviate suffering and promote joy to as many people as possible. 
you'll never work another day in your life and you'll have more meaning and fulfillment and joy and satisfaction than I think you could get in any other, in almost any other venue. Like, um, you know, next to my marriage and my children, this is the most sacred work I will ever do. Um, and so I don't understand your question. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, that really is beautiful. And even though you aren't the prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you really are affecting change from the inside out. You are exposing truths. You are educating people who don't know the true history of the church. And even bigger than that, I think just having on regular people helps other people say, oh, I'm not alone in this. I'm not the only one who's felt that way. I'm not the only one who's had that said to me by a bishop or... I thought that what I was feeling was a little weird, but I guess other people feel it too. And giving people that sense of community that they have lost since leaving the church. And this is meant as a compliment and also just a fact for our listeners here. You are the number one podcast that people go to when they are having a faith transition because you are gentle in the way that you say things. And like we mentioned before, you're not trying to burn down the church, but you really want to help educate people and help alleviate their suffering just by showing hey, someone else has been through this, or um, or this is how they dealt with this problem, maybe you could try that. Bringing on experts to talk about the history of the church. I love the whole, um, what was with uh, LDS discussions? Yeah. Um, oh, such, such a great series where you just break down every part of the church. If people have questions about it, they can go to that. And it's just an important resource that you're providing. So thank you for that. And I, I think I can speak for everyone here. Thank you for what you are doing. It's immensely helpful, as you already know. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's a it's it's an honor and it's a privilege and uh, it's fun. It's creative, like learning new platforms. Like I started out as an audio only podcast, mm -hmm. and to be able to like move into video, move into YouTube, and then TikTok and Instagram and yeah. social media, like. It's, it's never ending and we've done retreats and we've done workshops and I've done individual coaching. There's so much joy in this work. So I think it's a, I'm surprised more people don't do it. I'm so like, whenever a creator comes up, I don't view him as a competitive threat. I'm like, holy smokes, we have somebody wanting to get in this work. I need more, like I need more partners. I need more collaborators. We need more heroes. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, I don't like to think of myself as a hero cause that's prideful. But like, I love this idea of the Avengers or the X-Men or the superheroes, super friends, like Wolverine's awesome, but Wolverine plus Wanda, you know, <laughs> plus Vision, yeah. plus Dr. Xavier, you know, plus, you know, Captain America, like that's amazing. So like, this is fun work. It's hard. It's grueling. Yeah. It's painful but it's super rewarding mm -hmm. and it's super needed and it's understaffed. Yeah. So like, I, I love how, how quickly your, your YouTube channel is growing. A huge part of that is your talent and, and Jonathan's support. Um, but it's also, there's just such a need, you know, there I hope you're having need. fun. I am having fun. I hope fun. you don't go away. Cause <laughs> Thanks, what happens John. is people like you come online and then they, they, they get beat up and they quit. You know what? That's that's a really great point. And it, it is hard because it's such a big topic and it is very polarizing. I have people in the comments that are like, yes, thank you. I need your work. I need what you're offering. Thank you for doing this. And other people that are just not for it. And yeah. it, it can get hard, the negative criticism. So I wanted to ask you from a fellow creator's standpoint, how do you deal with negative criticism? Like, teach me the ways because I'm only in five months and I'm like, oh, this, this kind of hurts, even though the pros definitely outweigh the cons. What are your, your secrets to approaching that? I see you getting emotional again. A little bit. <laughs> Is it true? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's tough. They it's, can be tough. Isn't the space brutal? Yeah. Yeah. It just chews people up and spits them out. Like yeah. it's, it's no joke. Like I don't like to call the Mormon church a cult, but like fighting against multi hundred billion dollar, high demand religions and or cults is uh, extremely hard and painful yeah. and um, punishing. It's punishing. I don't think there's another word to describe it, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's super rewarding and it's super punishing. Because mm -hmm. you've got all the Orthodox, you've got the millions of Orthodox members that all want you not to exist, Yeah. right? That all want to criticize you and smear you or, you know, 
um, criticize you. But then you've also got just, you know, the, the ex Mormon crowd, the ex religious group can also be, it can be toxic, brutal too. Super toxic. Yeah. And, and, and even more mean spirited and more vicious. Like I would say, if I had to pick my top 10 most vicious adversaries, all 10 would be ex Mormons. Really? Versus any Mormon apologist or, or Orthodox Interesting. Mormon. Yeah. So, so ex Mormons are amazing and then some are horrific. Mm -hmm. That's just the, so you get it on all sides. Anyway, um, I would say, uh, just like when you play the guitar over time, you get calluses on your fingers. Part of it is just time mm -hmm. and just taking the criticism. Um, so, so that's number one. You just gotta not quit. Like I, I know I'm not the smartest creator out here in ex Mormon land. I'm not the most creative. I'm not the most attractive. Like, I'm not the most knowledgeable. I am the one who's been doing it the longest, but that's just because I started really early. There might be someone who's been doing it longer than me. But I mean, my if I have a superpower, which I don't, but if I did, it would be not quitting. Yeah. Not quitting. Because I've had people accuse me of, of abusing women. I've had me people accusing me of harming children. I've had people accuse me of financial impropriety. I've been smeared and defamed in ways that are not only career ending, but are life ending. And that's, you know, that's just that. That's just the the defamation. On, on the whole other side of the spectrum is like, your teeth are crooked, your teeth are yellow, your nose is crooked, you're dumb, you're, you know, you're, you're old, you're irrelevant, you're boring, you talk over people. And all of that's true. That's right. Not true. But but at the same time, like it's hard to hear all that over time. So there's no secret sauce other than just like you just keep playing the guitar, sometimes till your fingers bleed, and over time you develop calluses. And that's probably the number one suggestion is don't quit, Shalise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't quit unless your physical or mental health require it. Mm -hmm. Then quit. Absolutely quit. If it's if it's damaging your physical or mental health, quit. But if you can survive it, then you're going to flourish. Yeah. So don't quit. Okay. And just give it time. The second thing is you have to just ignore the trolls. It's hard. I know it's hard so, to do. <laughs> I know so many creators that feel like they have to engage. Yeah. First of all, they have to care about what these haters say who have no skin in the game. There's a really good Teddy Roosevelt quote that I should read, but it's, you know, Brene Brown was made it famous, but I was a Teddy Roosevelt fan before Brene Brown ever came up. But it's just this idea that like, unless you're in the ring, unless you're in the, unless you're on the battlefield, you've got no place criticizing those of us who are. So literally like you can, you can, you can literally ignore every single critic out there that isn't in this battlefield with you. Mm. And that eliminates a lot of voices, right? Sure does. <laughs> and guess what? You're not going to hear criticism from me because I've got too much respect for somebody who enters the arena. So you're only going to get like praise from me and support and maybe some a tip, some tips. And so that that really simplifies your life when you realize you can completely ignore everyone who's got anything to say about what you're doing that isn't that isn't putting their own skin in the game. All right. That's great are advice. You, are you willing? I'm not done. I see Jonathan nodding over. <laughs> yeah. why, why are you nodding, John? No, you don't have to answer. But but I'm not done. But but it's harder to say, you know, because so many creators just, they, this is hard enough work when you feel empowered. If you're constantly draining your emotional energy, reading and listening to, and worst of all, engaging these people that just want ill for you and that offer nothing to the world, let alone to you. And all they want to do is sap your attention, your energy and your time. You're done. You're dead. You're dead on arrival. So you just, you block those people. Anyone who comes to any of your channels showing mean spiritedness, uh, cruelty, you know, bigotry of any sort, you block and ban them. Ain't got time for that.
right? Yeah. And that's going to simplify your life. I used to get so much hate for censoring and moderating people. And there are other people that are going to disagree with me. And all I'm going to say is you enter this arena for 20 years <laughs> yeah. and see how long you can endure without blocking and banning the haters. But over time, I, I just, I just decided they wouldn't treat me if they were in my house, they wouldn't have the courage to say the crap that they say to me, to my face. You know, mm -hmm. so why are we going to let them in my virtual house and let them disrespect me? No, if you disrespect me in my physical house, you're out the door. Why is it going to be any, any different on social media? So just liberally block and ban and ignore, most of all, ignore the haters. And by the way, what do haters want? What do they want, Shalise? Your attention. They want your attention. Yeah. They want your destruction. They want your attention and they want your demise. And they want attention for themselves. Yeah. So you're only feeding them literally the food that they that will sustain them by giving paying any any time of day to them. So unless it like provides you with good video, like you know, like reading the hater comments and making fun of them, like that can get you views and subscribers, right? <laughs> That's true. So unless you're using them to grow your channel, you ignore you ignore them. Yeah. Don't feed the trolls. Ignore them. Block and Don't them. feed the trolls. I yeah. need a t-shirt that says that. Don't feed the trolls. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, I love constructive criticism. So I'm not saying block and ban your critics. Yeah. If people come to you with reasonable, good faith suggestions, that's the only way you become successful mm -hmm. is by listening to your critics. It's just the mean-spirited haters, not the thoughtful critics mm -hmm. that you want to get rid of. Yeah. 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 Okay. You want, you want the next little bit of advice? Yeah. Become financially sustainable. Mm. So like, do you know that I've done a lot of hard things in the past 20 years? Do you know what the hardest thing I ever did was? Asking for donations. No, that was hard. Yeah. That was hard. When I left Microsoft, I was making 200, 200,000 plus dollars a year when I left Microsoft. So that was back in 2004. Okay. So for the first 12 or 13, I don't know, I'll, I'm making this up, but let's just say for the first 12 years of Mormon Story's existence, no, probably 17 for the first, I don't know, a long time, well <laughs> over a decade, I was getting paid little to nothing for doing Mormon Stories. Yeah. And then at some point, by not quitting, by improving and by sticking with it and be trying to be creative, grow the channel, we were able to get enough revenue where at some point I was able to get to the point where I had the cash to pay myself what I was making 20 years ago. Wow. After two master's degrees and a PhD and 15 years in the business. Like yeah. finally I had the, the money to allow my board to pay me what my market value was. And that was terrifying to me because Mormons are the cheapest most sort of chintzy sometimes people when it comes to people like us, they call, you know, Thomas S. Monson, Gordon B. Hinckley, Russell M. Nelson, Dallin H. Oaks, they can pull down 300 K plus a year, lifetime pensions, a million dollar signing bonus. They can free health care. They can pull all that down for themselves. But as soon as somebody who's actually, trying to make Mormonism a healthier, happier place, tries to earn a living, the Mormon and ex-Mormon internet goes mad. They go crazy. And they're like, how dare you pay yourself a livable wage? Or God forbid, Heavenly Father forbid, how dare you pay yourself your market value? And so I, the Kraken was unleashed when I, when I allowed my board to pay me what I was making 20 years ago. And, and for years I was terrified to release my financials. I did, but I was terrified and I was mercilessly brutalized online for making a, a livable wage, you know, which is crazy because what you do takes so much time and effort and you were on it every single day working and doing oh. episodes. And I mean, flying people in and like it, the work you do, that doesn't even come close to what you should be getting paid for how much time and effort oh you put gosh. into it. I easily have worked 60 hours a week for the past 20 years. Yeah. And the sacrifices to my family, healthcare, retirement, 
all sorts of things. We'll never, we'll never make back the financial sacrifices we made for Mormon stories, even at my current compensation levels. So my, my, my next thing is do not, do not be afraid to ask for money, ask for money, just like you asked for subscriptions and click the bell and all that, mm -hmm. ask for money, get a, get a, a, a PayPal or a donor box and just ask people to donate. So sign up for Shalise's Patreon right now. Pay your creators for their work or they'll go, they will go away. You will lose them. How many amazing creators like infants on thrones, brother, Jake, John Larson, like, like you're a polygamy, like pick your amazing, you know, uh, you know, podcast or YouTube channel that's in the boneyards that you've never heard of anymore because their creators were never paid and they got sick of it and quit. Like, don't let that happen. Why does Bill Real and Radio Free Mormon, why are they still existing? Because they're making decent money now, mm. right? Why am I able to exist? Because I make money. So get yourself paid. Uh, don't be ashamed get all the money that you can because this is brutal work and you viewers and listeners step up and pay Shalise for her amazing work. Thank you, John. Yeah, for sure. Great advice. Yeah. A lot to mull over and talk to talk about with my producer over here. <laughs> because if you're going to face the slings and arrows of your opposition, it's way better to do that when you're pulling home a fat or a healthy sustainable paycheck. Yeah. Right. I can focus more on it. I mean, each episode that I do with editing and recording is probably like six, seven hours per episode. Yeah. And I do that weekly. So yeah. it's a lot. Yeah. 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 You should be making, you should be making at least five figures, if not six for the yeah. good you're, you're doing people. You should absolutely be making that. Yeah. Yeah. No question. All right. Well, okay, I have one more question from me, and then I think I have one or two from our listeners here. But, And if this is too personal, we can skip it. I was wondering, because you are, I guess someone label you like the ultimate ex-Mormon apostate type of thing, how does your family handle this? Or what is it like for you in your personal life being who you are and being this, this megaphone for Mormonism? Thank you for asking. Margie, before I left, Margie's like, don't, you know, don't disclose anything about our kids. Like sh allow our kids their privacy. Like that is top of mind in this work because by far the most painful part of all of this has been the familial pain and sacrifice that has been made by my, by my wife, Margie, and by my four children. Mm. Because, um, you know, whether it's trying to live in Utah when you're, dad is viewed as the Mormon church's number one enemy yeah, and all the ways that they were excluded from groups and friendships were cut off and, uh, were, were judged and punished socially for just being my child. That's been horrific, mm. um, for them. And then even, even the things that you would assume are good, like people stopping you and thanking you for what you do or them, being noticed and maybe even being given an opportunity because they're my child. Like it turns out that any self-respecting child wants to succeed on their own. Mm. They never, they never want to be known as someone's kid and they never want to get an opportunity because they're someone's kid. And so, and the last thing they want to do when they're at a jazz game or home Depot with their dad is to be stopped by quote, adoring fans or whatever to like, can we take a photo? They're just like, no, can I just go to the restaurant and have a, a meal with my dad and mm -hmm. not be interrupted and not be stopped and, and not have to sit for 15 minutes while someone tells my dad their life story while we're just trying to have fun. And I'm not trying to be disparaging to the wonderful supporters uh, that are out there, but from the perspective of Margie and my kids, mm -hmm uh it's it's not been good uh it's been painful and very very difficult for them and in some ways inhumane and then if your dad's getting smeared constantly on the internet you're hearing the most horrific things about your your dad who you love and then you got to wade through how much of it's true what's not true and then even if you don't believe any of it 
why are people constantly smearing my dad and having all these horrible things to say about him? That's not fun. They're often bullied if they venture to get an Instagram account or a Twitter account. They're often bullied on social media Ugh. just for being my children. So that's not fun um, for them. But then should they not be allowed to be on social media? And then even the thing that you would think would be best of all for them when someone comes up to them and says, aren't you lucky to have John and Margie as your parents, isn't it? It must be wonderful to, to be their children, you know? You'd think that'd be a compliment, right? Mm -hmm. But but my kids are very quick to say, you know what? You don't know what it's like to be John and Margie's kids. You don't know how good of a dad John is behind the scenes. You yeah. don't know what he's like. You don't know what, what my parents are like. You have no idea. We're a family just like any other family. My parents have flaws and weaknesses just like everybody else. Like, why are you assuming that it's wonderful when it might be the opposite of that? So like on every level, this I, I I completely egregiously horrifically underestimated the pain and difficulty and cost that my family would bear for for what I do. Ultimately, do they support what you do? Do they understand it's for some sort of greater good? For years and years and years, it was just something that Margie tolerated, like lovingly, supportingly, but annoyingly in other words it's like if you got to do that mormon stories thing i'll support you but it's just it's really painful and it's 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 annoying and it's tedious and i'm sick of it and i wish we could just move on you know what i mean mm -hmm. so for many many years my my kids didn't care and margie was basically supportive but um uh, but but bothered by all the things taxed by all the things that i mentioned Always in a loving and supportive way. Um, and then, you know, over time, uh, all my family has become very supportive, mostly because they become very, they become feminists, they become intellectuals, they become LG, LGBT themselves or LGBTQ allies or affirming. They've seen the way the church has harmed families and people. And so they, they all value the social justice elements to what I do. Mm -hmm. um, but it's all sweet and sour for yeah. all of them. They're supportive and respectful on a level and probably disturbed and annoyed uh, on a level. And it's always going to be bittersweet for them. But overall, amazingly supportive. They've sacrificed unbelievable amounts for us, for you, for my viewers and listeners. And so I'm infinitely grateful and indebted to them for their support. Yes. Shout out to John's family. Thank you for allowing him to continue this hard, grueling, but work that is helping millions of people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I do have a question. Let's see. From one of our listeners here. Okay, so this is from Finding My Truest Self. What are your current beliefs or spirituality practices? The term spirituality has been poisoned for me a little bit and for many people who leave Mormonism or high-demand religion. It's kind of tainted um, because it's associated with the literal idea of spirits, mm. ghosts or spirits or... And obviously, for me to even entertain the word spirituality, I have to kind of define the terms. So I no longer view spirituality as like a belief in a higher power or some sort of transcendent power or a belief in spirits just because I've seen those beliefs hijacked by infinite religions to coerce and cause undue harm to billions. Mm -hmm. So like it's triggering for me. Um, now that doesn't mean I don't have thoughts or feelings about God or an afterlife or whatever, but I have to define the terms. So for me, spirituality means being connected to a higher purpose, being connected to something greater than yourself. And so obviously, for me, Mormon stories is a, my main source of spirituality because I am constantly 
connected to a cause, which is the cause of truth, the cause of justice, this beautiful community that I'm a part of, humanity in a sense, helping awaken humanity to undue influence, helping people get their lives back, and then helping people live the most healthy, happy, meaningful life that they can. So for me, that's enough spirituality to last me the rest of my life. I don't need to believe in a heaven or a hell. I don't need to believe in like chakras or chi or reiki or um, prophecies or scripture, I don't, I, right? resurrection. I don't need to believe in any of that to have an incredibly fulfilling life. And then if you add to that, just my, my love for nature, being connected to the outdoors, like between humanity and the outdoors, all my spiritual needs are getting met. Mm -hmm. um, now that's, that's kind of the term spirituality in kind of a very narrow sense. Do you have follow-up questions to that? Because there are other domains of traditional spirituality that you may have actually been asking me about. No, I think our, our question asker here was more just wondering what your current beliefs are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. With, if, if it's Christian or agnosticism yeah. or... Okay, sorry. That no, was that's a, okay. I no, mean, spirituality was... is a part of that. So I have never once in my life identified as an atheist. Um, so I don't identify as an atheist. And uh, I've never identified as an agnostic, although I believe technically every human is agnostic. And what I mean by that is th the term agnosticism, I think, literally means do not know, does not know. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to death or an afterlife or a God, I think it's for anyone who's objective, they're going to just sort of admit that no one really knows what happens when you die. Nobody really knows if there's a God. If there's a God, nobody knows what the nature of God is. Everybody's guessing. Mm -hmm. Even if you've had incredibly, even if you've had a near death experience and Jesus visited you, you don't know whether that really happened or is literally just neurochemicals coursing through your brain. You don't know. You may think you know, but tell that to the person that believes they were abducted by a UFO and had sex with an alien. There are people who would die for that belief. So how do you as a religious person distinguish between yourself and a, and a QAnon person or a UFO believer? You can't. So we're all agnostic but I don't identify as an agnostic because I believe the terms atheist and agnostic tend to polarize more than they do unite. Right. And I want, I am against polarization, believe it or not, even though some people view me as extremely polarizing, I hate polarization. So I don't choose identities or really invest in terms like cult um, or atheist or agnostic that just tend to turn people off. Now I'm not against using the term cult, I think the term cult is very important. And I think studying cults and undue influence, whether it's Stephen Hassan, mm -hmm. Lindsay, um, what is, uh, Luna Lindsay Corbden, like cult awareness and studying undue influence is crucial. So you don't need my blessing, but you <laughs> have my full support in your use of the term. But I tend to not use it because I don't like to alienate the people that I want to reach. Right. So um, I, I have no idea if there's a God. I have no idea if there's an afterlife. I love Jesus. I love the teachings of Jesus. I also love the teachings of Buddha. I love the teachings of Lao Tzu. There's not a supernatural element to any of those teachings, but I'm better because of Eckhart Tolle. I'm better mm. because of secular Buddhism. I'm better because of the teachings of Jesus. So any teaching that helps me be a kinder, compassionate, more loving person, I believe in. So in that sense, you could call me a Christian, but do I have an active belief that Jesus died and on the third day was resurrected and that he died for our sins and we'll live with them again? Again, I don't think anybody really knows. So, and then the only other caveat I'll say is, and I kind of have already said this, when it comes to things like new age stuff, Reiki, new, you know, like, um, uh, new age mysticism, new age mysticism, a little bit Reiki stuff, like uh, mediums, teal swan, like any time any human is claiming supernatural powers, my alarm bells go off mm. because I can you can you can leave the frying pan and jump right in the fire, and you jettison your Mormon prophet or your Mormon bishop or the Mormon cult or whatever you want to call it, 
And then all of a sudden your spiritual advisor, your shaman is telling you what you need to do with your life and potentially financially or sexually exploiting you. Yeah. So like claiming, I've, I've, I've said jokingly that like claiming to have special powers or a visitation from the divine should be made illegal. It's just too much power for anyone to have. Even somebody standing over you with their hands saying your fifth chakra is blocked and I, you need to unblock your fifth chakra. I've seen that be used as undue influence to control people's lives. Mm. Not to mention telling somebody, oh, I'm talking to your dead loved one that, that you miss, but let me channel what they want for you in your life. That's too much power. And so I'm, I'm, it's not that I'm saying all of that's invalid. It's not that I'm even criticizing people's sacred beliefs. I'm just saying any of that stuff raises immediate red flags for me just because of where I've come from. Yeah. And I say people beware of anyone claiming special powers. Chances are they want your time, your money, or your sex. Yeah, it can get really tricky, especially when you leave a high demand group and then you see something that seems or appears to be opposite of that and jumping headfirst into that. And without realizing it, you're giving them your money and your time, everything that you are trying to avoid in this other high demand group. So it can definitely swing both ways. And there's always going to be levels within anything, just like people always say, well, you left one cult for another because I, I am more of like the law of attraction type of person. But just the same as yoga itself is not a cult, there can be cults that practice yoga. Yeah. And that's like all that they, yeah. they base their cult around is yogic pra practice. So yeah, you just have to be careful. You got to keep your eyes open, follow the bite model. If you have any questions yeah, about, am exactly. I in a cult? Let's see, is there behavioral yeah. control, information control, thought control, emotional control? If not, if you feel like you are a self-sovereign being, which is what I promote on my podcast of consciousness to me, consciousness is being aware of yourself, being aware of your surroundings and being able to Decide for yourself what you want to do with your life without someone else telling you what to do with your life. Just being in complete control of yourself is my motto. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. And and may I add on the other extreme, do I believe that there's something propelling forward humanity? Yeah. Do I think there's awe and magic and wonder in this existence? Absolutely. Do I feel like some unexplicable force helped me do what I've done? Yes. Do I feel like that power, whatever it is, still uh, engages my work every day? Absolutely. Do I know what that is? No. But I think it's important to have awe, a sense of awe and wonder and curiosity and, and even mysticism. I think there's a place for that. It just needs guardrails. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think everything just needs to be regulated and monitored yeah. in some sort of way. By the way, that's why your podcast is so awesome. Oh. Because you're focused on helping educate people so they they have awareness. So kudos to you. Thank you. Yeah, that's all I'm trying to do is just spread awareness. I'm not trying to tear anyone down. I just want people to see things from new perspectives. And that's what people can offer when they come on my show, especially you. <laughs> All right, so this next person, I don't know if they're okay with me saying their name, so we'll just leave it anonymous. What's been the most difficult thing about not being LDS anymore? Mm. Is there anything that's been more difficult after leaving the church? I mean, there's the obvious stuff where you lose your identity, you lose your sense of morality, you lose your sense of meaning and purpose, you lose family members, you lose your friends, you lose your entire community, you lose your resolution about the afterlife and you basically become a shell of a person. Uh, and you wonder, not only do you wonder why you exist, but you wonder who you are, and you feel resentful about all the decisions you made under false pretenses. Like other than that? Other than that? <laughs> <laughs> What's been the hardest thing about my faith crisis? No, yeah. I'm sorry, uh, that was a ramble. Um, uh, for me, it's been having, like I have, a, there's a family member, a close family member, who is a really important part of my immediate family, who when I come to their house to visit, they leave the house. Oh no. So they, and then because other family members are under the influence of that family member, I really don't have much a relationship with any of those other family members. Mm. So in a very real way, 
this sort of hard Jehovah's Witness or Scientology like shunning mm -hmm. where major major members of your family you have no of your immediate family and you see them and you run into them on a weekly or monthly basis they don't talk to you they don't look at you they don't watch you in their lives you don't know them and they don't know you or their kids because of because of the their beliefs like that's excruciating and it torments me every day yeah and i'm reminded every day of the ways i'm not able to be an uncle to you know and and certain nephews and nieces don't even know me because they think i'm evil mm. because of you know these types of relationships so that's that's one thing yeah Super that's hard. difficult and that's something that i always try and speak on to our listeners or people who have never been in high demand religions is you really do lose family members and it's so hard and then when you have that layered on top of your family actively saying you're led by Satan and you have the church that supports them saying that you're led by Satan and they're they're getting this confirmation from the church that they truly believe in it's really difficult to permeate that like you you understand why they do it because the religion that they love and they believe in truly and honestly is telling them that that's how they should respond to these people who have left the church so it's so difficult because you can't blame them, yet at the same time you want to shake them and be like, I'm a real person. I'm still great. I'm still a fun uncle. I, I'm fun to be around. I'm not going to give you alcohol before your legal age. I'm not going to do I'm not going to try and tempt you and lead you down a wrong path. I just want to love you and I just want to have a relationship with you. So I, I can understand that and it's really difficult. And I'm sorry you've had to go through that. Well, it wouldn't be fair if I didn't have to deal with what every other ex-Mormon, you know, and ex-member of a high demand religion has to deal with so you know it comes to the territory i will say i have a lot of privilege this podcast has afforded me a lot of privilege because on every other dimension that i mentioned to you so like identity mm -hmm. i know who i am more now than i ever did as a mormon morality i'm a more moral ethical person now than i ever was as a mormon i have a better marriage now than i ever did while i was a mormon I'm a better parent to my kids than I ever was as a Mormon. I've got closer friends now, truer friends, deeper friendships than I ever did as a Mormon. Yeah. I've got a better community now. Um, and I'm not, I don't sweat the afterlife. And just most of all, I just, I love life and I love every day I wake up. So not everyone who leaves Mormonism or high demand religion is able to fill all those domains as comprehensively as, I've been able to do, fortunately for me, but that's why I do what I do to help other people do that as well. Many have, and uh, that's why I created the Gift of the Mormon Faith Crisis podcast. It's at mormonfaithcrisis.com. It's 70 hours of free coaching in addition to Mormon Stories podcast where you, you can learn about healthy sexuality, healthy marriage, healthy parenting, identity development, uh, stages of grief, how to communicate with believing family and friends. It offers tools and tips and tricks for free for anyone who wants to end up feeling like their faith crisis was a gift, not a crisis. Because mm -hmm. a lot of one of the biggest criticisms I get is from ex Mormons that say, stop calling it a faith crisis. It's like a truth awakening. Oh, it's like a rebirth. Yeah. So stop calling it a crisis. It's like the best thing that could ever happen to you. <laughs> And that it doesn't feel like that when you start going through it. Yeah. Or at least not for all people. But absolutely, more often than not, it becomes the best thing that ever happened to you. Mm -hmm. uh, you just have to you just have to navigate it right and figure out how to make it an amazing thing. But for me, it's been the biggest gift of my life, for sure. Yeah. And it can be that for you. And that's why I do Mormon Stories podcast. That's why I release Gift of the Mormon Faith Crisis podcast. And that's what cult of consciousness is all about, right? <laughs> yeah, I love ending on that high note because I was going to go back and say, well, how are those things now that you've left and you covered it? So thank you, you read my mind. Um, because it can be difficult and I think it is a crisis initially and then once you realize that you can have all of those beautiful things outside of the church and they can be better and stronger and happier and healthier, then it does become an awakening of self when you realize, oh wow, I have an identity besides being Mormon. Yeah. I, I can connect more 
or with people who aren't Mormon. Whereas before I was creating this wall of us versus them, I got to convert. I don't know if I really want to be their friend, but I want to bring them to the church. So it's like these false pretense friendships. So I love that you're talking about how you can get over the hurdle of the crisis and find happiness again. Um, I think that's the biggest thing. And that's what I want to offer our listeners here is that there is hope and there are resources. So before we go, how can people find you? What are things that you're up to? The best way you could support us is by going to YouTube and subscribing to the Mormon Stories Podcast YouTube channel. Please follow us or subscribe to us on TikTok. Our TikTok channel is over 200,000. Yeah, you guys are killing it. We're over 210 now. Please follow us and subscribe to us on Facebook. Mormon Stories Podcast channel, and on Instagram. We've, we're on all those platforms. We love it when people are able and willing to donate, uh, become a monthly donor. Send to this Mormon guy Stories some Podcast. money. There you go. <laughs> you can go to mormonstories.org and then click on the donate button, become a monthly donor. We're transparent in our finances, uh, and um, we uh, we try to spend every dollar um, supporting uh, people who are in need. So after you support Colts to Consciousness financially, become a donor to Mormon Stories Podcast and subscribe and follow and then share our content. Spread the word because word of mouth is a great way to get this stuff out there. Yeah. Awesome. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much again, John. It's been a pleasure getting to interview you. And thank you so much to our listeners. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious and be well. Thanks for listening. If you like what you hear, it would mean a lot if you could like and subscribe on YouTube and leave a review or a comment to help with our visibility. You can also find me on social media at Colts to Consciousness or reach out by email at Colts to Consciousness at gmail.com.